cannot be said to be an evidence-informed organization because fundamentally the, the focus of the evidence is in the decision. If you're not aware of what decisions you're making, how can we be evidence-informed? People judge a woman more harshly when she negotiates than a man. And so a woman needs to pay more attention to the style and the impression that she is creating. Do you know when corporations are watching you? Or how much they already know about you? The answer will shock you. Alessandro Acristi always puts safety first. He knows the helmet will keep him safe on the road, and the same goes for his social media profile picture. I do have a Facebook profile. On my profile picture, I wear a motorcycle helmet. Uh, your name and your profile picture are public by default. Therefore, they are searchable. So my question is, uh, how much can I learn about you starting just from a photo of your face? Now, marketers like us to believe that all information about us will always be used in a manner which is in our favor. But think again, why should that be always the case? Over the last 10 years, the ability of computers to identify faces has gotten a hundred times better. The ability of remaining anonymous is uh, shrinking, and the places where we can be anonymous are getting fewer and fewer. Alessandro Acquisti is a professor at Carnegie Mellon who does research on how technology impacts privacy. He says that smartphones may make facial searches as common as Google searches. The idea that you can start from a face and predict social security numbers from that face seemed quite alien and surprising, but now we know that it can be done. So there's no place to hide. Absolutely no place to hide. It's, uh, those places are shrinking. While technology is super important, um, I think um, it's equally important to understand how public policy and business models interact and work effectively well together. I think this was a point made by Scott uh, as well in, in, the, in the first session. Uh, I think that's point number one. The second, I think, is this really uh, important partnership that has to exist between uh, the city, the county, the community, which uh, could be, quote unquote, a test bed um, for what we call an RD&D approach, a research, development, and deployment approach, which is the idea of being able to take ideas, test them, deploy them, and then, uh, and if they're successful, we've had actually startups come out of this activity, an entrepreneurial kind of activity come out of this. Uh, and third, I think um, the capacity to really um, think about value creation, not just from a business model standpoint, but also from a societal standpoint, you know, how do we measure societal value creation? A lot of studios believe in sort of this, um, I call it a bit of an antiquated rollout scheme associated with, oh, we'll, we'll release it in a limited rollout in the US, then we'll wait a, a, uh, about two months and have a, another rollout maybe in Europe, wait another two months, have another rollout in Asia. Once it hits the digital airwaves, it's available to anybody immediately. If I can find something that appeals to you and will convince you to subscribe next month, that's what I need to do to, to survive in, a, in an on-demand streaming world. Much more than what you needed with Nielsen, which is vast segments of the audience all watching the same content. Now they have decided they want to get into the content business and they have some significant competitive advantage that the traditional firms don't have. So now it's a combination of both. You have great opportunities, but then you have to navigate all this competition as well. You could literally uh, split the music industry in two, two periods, before Napster and after Napster. That's the kind of impact the Napsters of this world had on the industry. I think uh, first there's a very serious copycat problem as there was with school shootings and, and I don't see that as necessarily coming out of the Black Lives Matter environment. I, but I see just a, a, a lot of change going on in policing because police are now being held much more accountable for the things they do that might be wrong. And there has been growing tension between police and communities. And certainly uh, black lives do matter in terms of the uh, people being hit by police. But black lives matter also because 
when, when homicide rates go up, they probably go up more for blacks than they for whites. Do. Uh, most of our theories are think about a single sanction. How does imprisonment deter crime? But of course, the alternative to imprisonment is not no punishment. It's some other lesser punishment. If you believe in the power of government to learn from its mistakes and improve the regulatory system to get better at protecting public health over time, you want to build in a lot of flexibility to the system. But if you think that in the long run it's going to be the industry lobbyists who are the stronger and more consistent pres presence at the regulatory discussions, then that flexibility could end up with evolving the system towards more favorable to industry interests and less favorable to public health. So that's that's the crux. You know, consumer-directed health plans are a huge change in the employer-sponsored insurance market. And it's a big change in the deductible levels that employees are exposed to. Um, and so there's a big question as to how people are going to respond. Machine learning is becoming an increasingly valuable tool for preventing disease and improving population health at the societal scale. For the last decade, my lab has focused on advancing public health by developing new machine learning methods for anomalous pattern detection. Many countries in Europe and other parts of the world are reforming their health systems and trying decentralized market-oriented mechanisms. So understanding how those work, what works well and perhaps not so well, is very important. States have the option to opt out of that standard situation, and, it, and if they do that, then they can redefine what essential health benefits are. And you're right, that could really change things. Many swaths of people cannot afford basic life-saving medicine. Uh, mortality, morbidity rates are very uh, sky high in Africa, and they have, in, in turn, a security. Implication. The military action may be coming inevitable. It does seem like we're on an inexorable pathway towards military action, and, and this is a war, frankly, that we're not prepared for, that the American people don't want. This also provides the Prime Minister with the size of the legislative majority that he would need to push through the revisions to the Japanese Constitution that he has long sought. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the Prime Minister has a relatively strong hand in terms of conducting foreign policy and economic policy as he chooses.